Good evening, everybody. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our Bible study. And so, so if you would, first of all, let's go to the Lord. We're thankful, O oh Lord, for tonight that we have this opportunity to be able to continue our exploration of the book of Acts as we continue to see just how you reveal your your love for us, the plan for salvation you would know, have for us, the, uh, you give us the gift of adoption through salvation. So we're thankful, O oh Lord, that as we continue to grow and learn and mature in spirit, and spirituality that we also continue in our fellowship with one another so help us oh lord as we uh look for opportunities to apply what we learn and 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 grow in terms of the manner of how we see and understand your person and character which we love you we praise you and it's in the mighty name of jesus we pray amen amen, amen. all right it's great to be with all of you again I'm Matt Darby, if you don't know me, I'm one of the ministers of Mount Zion, and we are continuing in our study of the books of Acts with our topic for the month of May, Defending Christ Among Opposition. And this topic is giving us an opportunity to see Paul as he is going through the transitional phase to uh, march toward Rome on the defense for his life and how he is defending Christ in the midst of various different audiences. So for tonight, we're looking at a defense before the Sanhedrin. So we're gonna see Paul, how he uh, conducts himself in various ways before a tribunal of various priests in the Jewish temple. And so this is gonna cover Acts chapter 22. And we're gonna be from Acts chapter 22, verses 30 through 11. So the hope is we'll cover all of those verses tonight for our Bible study. So like I like to do, I like to kind of give a high level overview of what we'll address for tonight. And we start off in chapter 22, seeing the Roman commander request the Sanhedrin to convene because he doesn't know why he has Paul in custody. So he wants to figure this out in the manner he chooses to do is by instructing the Sanhedrin to understand the charges against Paul. Next, we see as Paul is addressing the Sanhedrin, the high priest orders Paul for Paul to be struck in the mouth because he believes that Paul has made a statement that violates the law. So we're going to explore some of that. Paul fails to recognize the high priest. And so I want to ask the question, you know, why was it that he didn't uh, recognize? There's various, um, I don't say theories, but there's various opinions about, you know, why it is he did not recognize the high priest. And I'm gonna ask the question to see what, what you may think. And, but he also, in the midst of that, he finds a way to use a division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees to convey the gospel. So we're gonna see how he does that. Um, because of that, we see this violent uh, dispute between these two groups erupt, leading the Roman troops to have to rush in and take Paul out. Uh, and yes, it could have been that they could have taken Paul out, but they had not removed it. And we finally closed this thing out, looking at Christ coming and appearing before Paul to encourage Paul for the journey and let him know that Christ got to go to Rome. So this is the high level overview of what we're covering for tonight. And I want to kick things off by looking at verse 30 of our uh, lesson for tonight. So if I got a volunteer that wouldn't mind uh, reading verse 30 from chapter 22. He released him and instructed the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin's He brought Paul down and placed him. Okay, so the key that's being mentioned here is the commander of the Roman troops. So, if we remember from last week, we saw that 
Paul was being charged from, from the crowd, the Jewish crowd, for having brought a Gentile inside the temple. And based on the oral law, you know, that was not, uh, that was not allowed. So because of this, this created this uproar that led for the uh, Roman commander to have to arrest Paul. He assumed, though, Paul must have been some Egyptian uh, uh, insurrectionist that they had been dealing with before, unknowing knowing to him that he's arresting a Roman uh, citizen. So now the Roman commander is trying to figure out what is, this is all about. You know, he doesn't understand the nature of what created the uproar. And what I find interesting here is that the text says that this commander had the power, it seemed, to instruct, not even necessarily to ask, but he instructs the Sanhedrin to meet to um, conduct this uh, trial with Paul to figure out what the charges are and why he needs to have uh, Paul in his custody. And this goes back to what we talked about for me the question about the Gentiles and their presence within the, uh, the temple. Because here's an example that seems to me, if the Sanhedrin is meeting in the temple, maybe they are, maybe they're not, it seems like you've got an instance where you've got Gentiles being the Roman troops, at least, that have access to the temple. And so I'm, I'm left to kind of come back to the question of, did God truly institute this rule for the Gentile to not have access to the temple? Was this always the case that the Gentiles were never allowed to go into the temple? So I want to show this diagram. This is Herod's temple. And Herod's temple is the second temple. Now we're looking at, if you remember reading your book, Ezra and Nehemiah, they built the second temple after the first one, Solomon's temple, was destroyed. But what happened is that after, this is now about 500 year period. The temple had been in disarray. So we're not talking about a complete restructuring from nothing. Herod comes in and, re and does a modification project to the temple. And so we, what we get is this grandiose uh, uh, place. What I want you to see, for those of you that have the ability to see, we have the Gentiles courtyard. And so that's out, that area is outside of the, the first wall that you see in the image. With the Gentile courtyard, that means that's where all of the selling that went place that Jesus got mad about because they were doing money changing and all of that activity. That was where that was being conducted. This was where the limits were for the Gentiles to be able to access the temple. They could not go beyond the wall. Now you see, you know, the um, uh, closer to the right of the, the image, you have the women's courtyard. So you have that courtyard that limits women, Israelite women, Jewish women, from only being able to have access beyond access to the altars, as you notice. On the other side of the wall, which would lead you to the priest courtyard, you have the altar where the sacrifices would uh, occur. And you have the holy place, which is the where where God's presence, the holy of holies, would reside. So, the question I kept asking myself was: Was this always how God had intended the temple in His relationship? Because the temple is a reflection of God's relationship to His people. Was it always intended for uh, the Gentiles, in this case, or women? And also, if we look at the women's courtyard, to be separated from God to the point they couldn't even have access to the altar. Take you to Numbers chapter 15, verses 13 through 16. And this is where Moses is receiving the initial laws that are being passed down to the Jews. In chapter 15 of Numbers, verse 13 reads like this. Every Israelite is to prepare these things in this way when he presents a food offering as, ple as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. When an alien, read that as a Gentile, read that as a foreigner, read that as someone who is not Jewish, resides with you, or someone else is among you and wants to prepare a food offering as a pleasing aroma to the Lord, 
is to do exactly as you do throughout throughout your generations. So it's so God is saying that the Gentiles have the same access as you would if they want to honor me and serve me uh, through a sacrificial offering. Of course, this is provided that they're they're following the strict rules that God has provided for how the sacrifice was going to be, what they were supposed to be sacrificing, whatever the case may be. So there is some evidence that at least shows that we see there's some access provided for the Gentiles to God when it comes to making sacrifices. The assembly is to have the same statute before for both you and the resident alien as a permanent statute throughout your generations. So there is no length of time. God says that this was supposed to be a permanent statute that just as these Gentiles would be able to sacrifice to me, you they should do the same as you do. The same law and the same ordinance will apply to both you and the Gentile who resides with you. So again, the indication and implication here is that if the Gentile was a worshiper of God or wanted to worship God, they would have the same access. So again, we go back to why the court of the Gentiles? Why the separation? What, what, why did that come about? So I also take you to Second Chronicles. Uh, this is now Solomon who built the first temple, and this is his prayer to God. So he's speaking to God, and he says this in chapter 6. Even for the foreigner or the Gentile who is not of your people Israel, you being God, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your strong hand and outstretched arm, arm. When he comes and prays toward the temple, may you hear in heaven in your dwelling place and do all the foreigner ask you. Then all the peoples of the earth will know your name to fear you as your people, Israel, do, and know that this temple I have built bears your name. So keep in mind about Solomon. David, his father, had the desire to build the temple. God said, no, it's not your work to do. I'm going to bring Solomon, your son. He's going to build it. And God had explicit instructions from the temple, very explicit instructions. And, you know, I'm pretty sure you're like me. When you read those instructions through Second Chronicles, you, your eyes start, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a builder. I'm like, why is this here? But it's an important reason for why it's there for us, because God is showing us to what limits in terms of his holiness, where the barriers were going to be placed, how he had specified for the temple construction, and how he was how how the Jews and anyone else for that matter was going to honor him. So my next graphic is to show you a comparison now of Solomon's temple compared to Herod's temple. Now you notice Solomon's temple is a lot smaller than Herod's temple. In fact, you don't see those types of walls and those divisions in Solomon's temple like you do with Herod's temple. Now you see that little square. Um, let's see if I got. <laughs> well, I can't do on TV. So there's a there's a square platform on Solomon's temple outside of the structure that is where the holy place resides. That's where the burnt offerings and sacrifices to uh, be made. And there's no barrier, there's no wall that will prevent Gentiles, women, or anyone to come to, to make their sacrifices. You have, as you saw earlier, with Herod's temple, you have a wall that separates the Gentiles. You have another wall that separates women. What's, what's the issue with this? I want to do another, show you another comparison, just to show you the size. So you have the size of an American football field. And for those of you listening to me on the phone, Solomon's Temple is maybe three quarters of the length of an American football field, but Herod's Temple dwarfs that. And so it's, it's humongous. And this comparison reminded me, if any of you have watched the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, there's the scene where Indiana Jones, the tem temple robber, he's with Nazis, and they're looking for the Holy Grail, this relic that is thought to be something of Jesus. And the Nazis go after the most embellished looking relic, thinking, well, Jesus, if he's the king of kings, he's the Lord of lords, wouldn't he have the most gaudiest, most 
uh, embellished uh, item, right? Whereas uh, Andy realizes, no, it would be something simple. He was a son of a carpenter. He was he didn't have great possessions, and so it would be this. And so when you look at Herod's temple, Herod built his temple, we built the, the version of his temple because he wanted to gain the Jews' uh, favor. So everything that was done was done to win over their favor. And uh, in that time frame, you had a lot of the issues that the Jews went through with. Now they're no more occupation. They're no longer in control of their land. And so you're starting to see those relationships sour between uh, Jews and, and the Gentiles. And so it, these walls become what I would consider these false barriers that we see even in the Christian church today. Traditions that we put up that aren't from God, that are not um, symbolic of what God would uh, uh, identify with him concerning our access. The only barrier that God had placed with the temple was the Holy of Holies, in which there was a veil that separated the place in which God's dwelling would be from everyone. And only one person, the high priest, would have access to go into the Holy of Holies, and he could only do so annually, once a year. And because of that, that was established because God is opposed to sin. You know, and, and so because he's opposed to sin, he would not be having, he his, his holiness could not have the interaction with us as sinful creatures. However, he still was going to accept and allow for the, the chief priest to present these offerings. So I look at this, this whole situation with Paul and why he's now dealing with you know, the issue of bringing a, a Gentile into the temple and the laws that he broke. And if we're, we're being honest, he didn't break at least the Mosaic Covenant. He broke the oral law. He broke man-made laws. And we're dealing with traditions that get set up. And here is an example for me that I think about it, about stuff like this, is that, like I said earlier, even in the church, in the, the church today, we have to be careful in terms of how we look at the things and the practices that we do, the traditions that we may uh, come come with, and make sure that we're not enforcing things that create and set up a barrier for other people to come and have access to Christ. I have had so many conversations with people who look at you know Christianity as being patriarchal because these barriers for women, or you have these groups who feel like they've got to identify themselves as Jews because they feel like only you know, the true access to God is through the Israelite not being a Gentile. And so we're going to engage as Christians with people who have this fixed mindset that there are these false barriers that, is, that, that have been established that, that separate them from, from God. So when we look and talk about this access and, and the access between God and his people, what it comes down to is making sure that we don't allow false barriers, whether it be traditions, whether it be false even understandings of scripture. Um, as I study and as I prepare a sermon, I'm always taking the time because even though I grew up in the church, I never want to assume that I'm coming with my assertions from what I was taught versus what I see explicitly in scripture. So I can even strip away my own false understandings and assumptions I've grown up with. So therefore I'm verifying, I'm checking and testing the word so that therefore when I come and teach to you or I'm preaching to you, I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to communicate that which thus says the word. That's why I try to communicate, read the word for yourself so that therefore you know and, and you can understand what God intends. And, and I know sometimes Reading scriptures like the the uh, Numbers and Leviticus and even Second Chronicles that go over the what well, seems like these dry readings can be boring, but there is such rich information there that communicates to us the nature of God's character and His person that we might, we we ought not gloss over it every time. It's, it may, it's not always a fun read. I I'm not be honest. It's not a fun read for me, but. That information is crucial for us to understand and see things like this to even understand the nature of barriers like the, uh, the, the gates and the, the, the court of the Gentiles that even were occurring in Jesus' day 
Because I think that's part of the reason why Jesus got mad about the money changers, because he saw that the temple was therefore became a, reflect, a false representation of access to God. And that's why I believe that part of the reason why the temple had to be destroyed, because it was no longer, uh, uh, apart from not just uh, the fact that no, it no longer represented access to God, because that's not Christ, but it, even in its physical manifestation, it wasn't even a, uh, a representation, at least when we talk about Herod's stuff. So any questions? Outside of the holy of holies, wasn't there a holy only the priest could go? The, the, so you had yeah you, the holy of holies yeah the the area outside of the holy of holies it had the holy I guess is what I what I recall yes well just the priest could go yes and then there was another place the holy of holies where only the head guy could go yes he could only go at a certain time yes the so holy it, is another. Isn't that another barrier? Yes. To man. Yes. That's, that but but you, but at least for the all to get to be able to make, offer your sacrifices and at least to be able to offer the um the to be able to make your sacrificial offerings. That's the distinction I always try to make. Well, okay, and I, mm -hmm. I, because when I saw the picture of there, well, apparently I'm like, okay, I guess the picture that I got in my mind was, you know, okay, that's that's the mega church, you know, with all their Apostles and disciples and all that. That's that's what he created. Right stuff. But and I guess when I saw Jesus being described, he was in the the outer court. Yes. Which was where everybody could go. Gentile, yeah. The Gentiles. Yeah. And that's and they 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 were up there selling sacrifices and mm -hmm. birds and you know, and he was like, Okay, this is not a marketplace. Okay, and that's what he Turned out, turned yeah. out, you know, money is get away. You cannot be selling all these things. You can do sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And I guess so. And following you, uh, I'll make sure I'm checking myself. Yeah. I guess. Parents' thing was like, you know, the, the, the worldly interpretation of what God did, very specific instructions on how to do. And if they took it somewhere else, trying to justify, because uh, that woman's thing, you know, was definitely knew that was separate. So, yeah, okay. So the other thing I want to point out, even with this verse that we read, just open up in Acts. It's the Roman commander that seems to be inside these very areas that seem to have been limited from the Gentiles. And we'll even see it when the Sanhedrin meets. Because if the Sanhedrin are meeting in, it's within the temple in the areas where how could the Roman, these Roman, which I can only assume, unless these commanders of the Roman guard were Jews themselves somehow. Oh, you know, there, there's clearly some. Yeah. Just like Paul, you know, Jewish, he was having a problem there, you know, he's from Jesus. But they gave him, the Romans gave him special treatment. Only one said, I'm a Roman citizen. A Roman citizen is above all of that. A Roman citizen, so he can, feels like he can roam the temple and do whatever he wants to. Like you say, he called together the meeting of the Jews. So I, I think it was some. To me, the Roman citizen was like a ruler role, and and Paul's was paying yeah, I know to, uh, you know, to kind of make them aware that you know you're breaking the yeah. law yourself. Well, I don't know if it's the Roman citizen itself would have been. If we're talking about just access to these areas, like especially with the restrictions of the the Gentile. Well, no, I don't know. I was saying that. Why is it that you? I thought you were saying why the Romans are like they're just they're, they can go anywhere in the temple. And I'm saying it's because they are above all this. These were the conquerors. I don't know if that was why they were able to do that. Because Paul, all the stuff they had going for him, but once they said he was a Roman citizen, they couldn't flog him. They because you know, he, think of it like a let's use like immigration as a great example, right? If I, as an American citizen, am in Mexico and I'm trying to cross the border, maybe I'm doing so legally, but uh, immigration forces are now trying to stop me at the border because they assume I'm a, I'm, the term we would use is illegal. Well, they're going to change their tune once I, they shall find out I'm an American citizen, right? So it's, so it's kind of the same thing in which if the Roman commanders are arresting Paul on the Roman law for the assumption that he was someone else, because they're, because again, the assumption was he was an outsider. And therefore, they, they assumed that he was someone who was breaking Roman law until they found out that he was a citizen. Now they're treating him, not you know, I'd say necessarily special, but they're just giving them legal rights as a Roman citizen to in terms of their engagement. Yeah, that's 
Any other questions, thoughts, or concerns? Let's move on to uh, back to Acts 23, and we'll start with verse 1 through 5. Can someone read for me Work verses 1 through 5? Paul looked at the Sanhedrin and said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience to this day. High priest Ananias, Ananias ordered those who were standing next to him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You are sitting there judging me according to the law, and yet in violation of the law, you are ordering me to be struck. Those standing nearby said, Do you dare revile God's high priest? I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, replied Paul, for it is written, you must not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So all Paul says here, he's looking straight at the Sanhedrin and he said, brothers, I've lived my life before God and all good conscience to this day. So why do you think that uh, the high priest had Paul struck in the mouth? Do you think he broke a law or? You think that he was being disrespectful. Figure, yeah. I wasn't recognized in the high priest, so why you should talk? It's possible because remember, yeah, Paul was a former member of the Pharisees. He was trained on the Pharisees, so he knew. He would do that. Yeah, that's what grandma used to do when I said the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, I honestly, I tried to find if there was some type of. The whole law that was more explicit. I couldn't find anything, but you know, I found it interesting, kind of the nature. But yeah, I kind of think that may be what it. Because the other thing too, I think sometimes when we're looking at these things, we may not be getting the full conversation and all the activity that they bring that up. Because so, in this case, Luke is probably just highlighting and pointing out what's core material to the, the message that he wants to convey. It's interesting that you say that because. Reading back the first part of looking straight, you just kind of think about you talking to somebody, even if the words that they say aren't bad by themselves, but when you get the, you know, stance and the forward looking and basically I'm at your level mm -hmm. and it says I'm speaking to you as opposed to the humbleness that may be expected when when talking um, in like to authority. I can I can that's what that reminds me of just sitting here just saying, yeah, I'm going to bring you down the side because, you know, just trying to respect that hierarchy sense. Yeah. Don't know for certain, but it's also possible that he didn't like being associated with him as brother mm -hmm. uh, to groom him into that their accompaniment. And then to say that he's lived his life uh, before God in all good consciousness, well, he's actually being accused of not living his life according to good consciousness of the high priest, right? So to him, that's blasphemy, right? And how did you silence that? So it's like dead in the mouth. Not that I would do that. Just saying that's what that's what works. That's what works. He said that's the memory part. You know, it's also interesting that they didn't even they didn't know Paul. As well known as he was, and then responsible for persecuting Christians. So they you would have thought that he had letters from the high priest when he went to to, to, to get these people. So I would have thought that would have been a well he would have been well known. They would have known who he was. And they think they know Saul. Yeah, what he said is interesting because they didn't know Saul either. Like Saul's Paul. It's interesting to note that this is about maybe roughly a 20 year period between that time, right? When he was so oh, okay. So some time has passed. And we've got a new high priest from when Paul was there compared to now. So, you know, but you know, you know, even within a 20 year period, I would assume it was kind of legendary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But she know it's Saul though. Maybe if he didn't call himself Saul, they didn't know that he called. Yeah, yeah, I think. Okay. I'll show you this other image too. 
So this is the thought of how the San Edrin would be configured. So, so the numbers get us to like 71. And so the basis of the makeup of the San Edrin is it's traced back to Moses, not Moses. Uh, yeah, Moses. Uh, when his father-in-law Jethro had suggested to them that you can't do all this alone, you need uh, plurality, what led to the plurality of elders to help take off the burden. And so we, what we get over the tradition and over years is this makeup of, of 70 from, so we had what were just elders from across the different uh, 12 tribes of Israel. So now here in Paul's day, it's more made up of the priests serving in the temple. And the thought is that the this type of uh, uh, trial would be occurring in the temple, but there were times in which sometimes maybe it would have occurred in the house of the high priest. So there is an opportunity, maybe that depending on where the high priest lived and where his home was, that this was occurring outside of you know, these particular chambers. But uh, based on that history, so you see where the accused, the accused is standing in a position directly in front of the high priest. Um, and then you have the 35 uh, on each side of Paul. And you'll have like, I guess, the gallery where you have students and other opportunity for other people to sit. Looking at this and looking at the scripture, Paul says that that's where I was talking about. Yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, it's just yeah. like, well, if, you know, this is the setup, he's clearly sitting in the high priest area. So I was going to ask, explain that statement of, I didn't know that he was the high priest. So my question, need not follow up with you, Phoebe, was going to be, what do you believe is the reason why he did not recognize the high priest? Because again, there's, there's been various opinions on this topic, so I'd love to hear just from you, like, what do you think or what, do you, what have you heard before in the past about this? I was, I'm trying to read it because I was curious about that too. He, was, he wasn't acting like it. Okay, he didn't recognize him. He was saying, you know, you're not acting like, I don't recognize you as a high priest because you're not acting like it. Think a high priest because a high priest wouldn't wouldn't break the law, wouldn't tell him to smack him in the mouth. But you weren't weren't acting like him. You know, so you know, it's like the it's like the person that's out there in the world, the Christians out there in the world, and the way they're acting, nobody believe would believe that they will you're not a Christian either. You're getting ready to go up and go to church, not the way you've been acting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then he just didn't recognize the best. A high priest, that's not the way a high priest should act, I guess it is. Really, because of the lack of respect for the person for the person in the office. Person, yeah, not the office. Yeah, yeah, not the office. Yeah, he's person. got a standard for the office. Yeah, and he said this person isn't acting like it, so there's no high person. I appreciate you. Anyone else? I think I thought it was maybe because he was thinking Jesus is the only high priest. So there's only one high priest. So maybe I don't know. That's the first thing we, I thought of when he asked the question. Hey, Brother Darby, I've heard, um, not sure how, you know, how accurate that is. It could have been something with his sight, because a couple of times he mentioned that there was, you know, something going on with his sight that maybe he wasn't able to distinguish whoever was in front of him or whoever was speaking with him, that it could have been a, a eyesight problem. Now, I've heard that too, and I think before the study, that's what I always believed, that it was possibly that. But of course, again, like you said, there's not been strong enough evidence to say for sure that's exactly what it was. Because I'm now more leaning toward what y'all have presented about the more the disrespect of the office, or not the office, but the person in terms of the nature of who it was. This one we're gonna look at a couple of different translations. And what message, the message by what it says is Paul acted surprised. How was that to know he was the chief priest? Mm -hmm. He doesn't act like a chief priest. Mm -hmm. Or whatever, you know, this particular yeah. translation um, kind of summarizes. And then that was, but yeah, it's interesting. It's like respect for the position, just like you said, the disrespect for the person. You could have said it because of respect for the position. That's another way the way you said it. I didn't. It's just respect for the position. Seeing that in this diagram, because you could, see, and it's not to dismiss that Paul did not have. 
poor eyesight or didn't have issues with his eyes. But even with this, it's like he probably he would have still been able to figure out in st where he's standing the alt voice, even if he didn't know that person per personally, kind of figuring out like, you know, who is or who that voice is that's, that's coming at him or whoever his companions were. They probably would have given him some feedback, you know, if he didn't know, you know, you, at least you kind of know when you're coming into like, I would even assume we, yeah, I want to use modern terms of like the courtroom for us today. We know we stand before the judge. That doesn't necessarily mean that that infrastructure is going to be the same for the Jews or even if this, the Sanhedrin uh, figure he is. He wasn't a newbie anyway. You know, What's that? 40 years before, you know, he, like he was telling me, he used to be, you know, this wasn't his first time, yeah. think, right? He was a Pharisee. He was familiar with the, you know, the, the setup and how it worked and stuff. So. It wasn't like he just came in here and looking around and figure out what happened, he said. Yeah, you know, the Bible says also that if you look straight at the Sanhedrin, maybe the high priest took that as a sign of disrespect. He wasn't, he wasn't facing him, he was looking at the body of the Sanhedrin. Yeah, and I like your, your analogy of court, right? And if the judge were listening to a um, defendant or someone and the defendant said something, Right. And if the judge were to say, Bailiff, go strike him in the mouth, right? People might say, Well, you're not acting like your honor. You're acting like something else, exacting your own judgment in that moment. Aren't you supposed to listen? Right? You're supposed to manage the trial, but you're not supposed to exact a punishment like that. Uh, so you're not being honorable. And such a judge can be uh, censored as well, right? And then, so yeah, I'm glad you yeah, brought that up because now it goes back to the reason why I probably struggled in the mouth. But yeah, the, the, the disrespect. Yeah. Um. So it says it reminds me of Matthew seven three. We see the speck in our brother's eye, but don't consider the beam in our own eye. And Tammy is asking, was there ever an occasion someone sat in the place of the high priest? Like someone else presiding in the high priest's place. That's a good question. Man. I'm, I do not know the answer to that. I'm not sure. Um, well, according to the <coughs> John MacArthur's uh, commentary, and he was making a statement that this was not a formal convening of the Sanhedrin, but an informal gathering somewhere outside of their normal uh, supporting view. They weren't sitting like this. Yeah. That he would know. He didn't know Ananias personally, so he would know it was a high priest. He wasn't sitting. They were sitting in this cell. And therefore, that would therefore go going back to what I was talking about today. Remember how how are they convened? They were convened by the woman commander, which, like I said, that seems weird. And the, and the woman commander has access to be able to come and come in and get access to Paul. So yeah, to to John MacArthur's commentary, that would make sense. That maybe most likely why they're sitting. Another. Have somebody coming off of you? But any other thoughts? And I don't know if you want to get this, but I like Paul's response that uh, he said if he had known, right, uh, he would not have done that because their law, their custom says you don't bring a charge or you don't. A disrespect an elder, right? I think in doing that, he kind of helps bring the calm back because he shows I'm a respectable person. I also know the customs in the law. And if I had understood that this was the high priest, mm -hmm. I would have never stepped out of character with this person. I think that that then helps them see that he may not be as far to the right or the left, whichever one for it, uh, as people might think or they might have thought he. And I, I wanted us to have this kind of conversation just to kind of explore this because, yeah, there's this is, I think, this is a great text of an example of where whatever conclusion we may make, well, based off of this, can also kind of be used to build on top of other conclusions that we make moving into scripture. And so that's why I think it's always important to just look at things we, like we say, read the word in context and, and look for context. And in and, and cases like this, because 
for third parties and we're looking at and we don't understand the cultural context of where what was going on we not being jews we're not you know in this environment there's it's easy maybe to have a misconception on things in terms of how the infrastructure of things work and it goes back to why reason why i wanted to talk about the court of the gentiles is the same thing it's like well if i look at the court of the gentiles and i see the beautiful gate and these infrastructures that were not in place or were not defined by god through the mosaic law but then i see it occur because the, the beautiful gate shows up as a setting you know later in earlier in acts and and you start seeing some of these things you kind of it starts building on top of like you know I'll say you necessarily false understand from the spiritual perspective but it does kind of help kind of maybe lead you to more kind of build up maybe some false conclusions because there's false assumptions being made on top of our understanding of a particular text so uh Tammy says i think he was also showing he wasn't a hypocrite by judging him so yeah kind of wrong Let's move, let's move on and let's see what else starts occurring in this uh, convening of the Sanhedrin. Can I get somebody to read verses 6 through 10? Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisee. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he said that, and when he said, when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the ascension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. Thank you. Yeah, so it's interesting. So going back, like what we've been talking about, about all sight, or at least his perception, we're seeing his perception here on display. You know, he's able to discern between these groups, between, oh, I'm in front of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and I know what they're about. So now he played them against each other to be able to deliver, to have an opportunity to deliver the gospel. And this, uh, this makeup and this uh, division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees leads me to ask this question. If you had opportunity Cause look, we've got groups out here that are believers, the Old Testament only. Like I said earlier, you've got people who you know, may only think that you know, the only way to heaven or only way to salvation is through uh, Jewish law. And so you may be engaging with people who are Old Testament only people. If you only had the Old Testament as a means to illustrate the uh, resurrection, what scriptures, what scriptures or passages would you use? So you only could go use Old Testament illustrations or scriptures, scriptures that point to or at least communicate the, the resurrection. Where would you go? What scriptures would you use? Okay. One place that Joel, where Joel says that after even after his death, I shall see the of my eyes, mm -hmm. my kind of speaks. So direction basically uh, right. there's, there's implication in there. And there it is, one of the oldest books, you know, the, the, the Bible. Job, I think, is uh, speaking to one of his friends there. Anyone else? In Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. When he's talking about, you know, it starts in 52, 13, when he's talking, he was pierced by transgressions. And then it goes on to 53, you know. Um, surely he was born our grace and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him and strengthened, spent by God and afflicted, but he was pierced by our transgressions. He was crushed by our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. What a great example. 
What's that? That's what Philip spoke to the unit about. Oh, okay, yeah. So any, anyone else? Hosea from Cambria. Yeah, I think um, Hosea is alluding to the resurrection and the call to repentance from that passage. Janae, she gives us Psalm 16, verse 10. I remember correctly, I think that's a Psalm of David. So he's speaking to our um, coming believer, or not in the coming of our Savior in terms of his Redeemer. Did you think of it? The Sadducees, they're supposed to be students of the law. Did they? Animals do not believe in the idea of the resurrection of angels or spirits. Yet, you know, hopefully using this exercise to point out there's, there's a ton of examples within scripture that point to and allude to the resurrection. Mm -hmm. I want to say I mean, that for simplify, I want to see the difference between the old and the new <laughs> resurrection of Jesus and the Old Testament, New Testament resurrection of Jesus. And we're saying that in the Old Testament, it alluded to that there was, there was going to be a resurrection of Jesus. And that's what these scriptures that we're talking about, that's what they mean. And even, I would even, we can even use examples of where we see even uh, people who were dead themselves being resurrected. Yeah, and those being examples also to allude to. Yeah, we bring it here, yeah, that part of it. Yeah, but I was, I guess, for me to keep it straight in my head, you know, what I learned about it is I distinguish the Old Testament and the New Testament by resurrection. Okay, now how do we get to the New Testament? And so to find when you when you ask that question, okay, that's why I was wondering. I was very interested in the answers to how we would allude to a resurrection. In the old days, I guess you know that we know if God knew it was coming, I just okay. <laughs> and 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 so you see that separation. Yeah, to your point, the, we see the allusions to to Christ, and then we see Christ on the scene. You know, in the flesh through the gospels and in the work, his works through the Holy Spirit after the, after the four, four books of the gospel. And so we're, we're talking about that which is to come versus that, versus that which is already occurred. You know what else? Hosea 6.22. Yes. Let us return to the Lord for he is torments. He will be the stroke us down. He will bind us up after two days. He will revive us. The third day he will raise us up. He will be the We look at Elijah and Elisha, right? When they both perform resurrections with um, a, a deceased child. And those are illustrations that point us to the resurrection of the dead. We've got um, Psalms 49 and 71 also as Psalms. I don't think they were 49 and 71 are from my uncle David. They also illustrate you know, the idea of uh, the resurrection from the dead. And so you see illustrations both that explicitly point to Christ and his resurrection. And you also see illustrations pointing to we as believers, 
we believe in God, we, there will be a day that we will come back into the presence of, of God the Father. And so therefore, death not being the end and being a, 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 an example, an illustration from what would be from the prophet Daniel, where, remember Ezekiel and the dry bones? So that, that's that's, that's a, an example in chapter 37. Uh, Jonah, right? You know, the belly of the, in the well, right? That's, that's a an example of an illustration because he's in the well for three days. Yeah. And on the day, third day, he spit back out to um, to be able to proclaim the gospel to the people he was trying to run away from. But it's it's the point here is to show that we've got multiple illustrations for if we were speaking to Sadducees or anyone who was like the Sadducees, because like I said, like I said, we're going to engage with people who may not be people or maybe people who want to take partials or portions of the gospel or the scripture, believing in them. And as, for those of us who are going to find ourselves engaged in evangelism, one of the most important things that we ought to do, and Paul is, is using is a great example of this, listening and allowing for people to speak to us, you start getting to know their character and where they stand and what their stances are, then you can respond based on what they give you as being led by the Holy Spirit to therefore address the spiritual concerns they may not even know they had. And I think that's why it's so important for us to be patient and to allow for the person to kind of communicate as opposed to us kind of browbeating people over the head over the scripture and, and trying to get off what we want, what we desire. Because yes, our desires for people to be saved is a good one. But sometimes that's going to come with the, the cost of family members who are just gonna, not going to have a heart for God in the times that we're lifted, or coworkers, or family members, or people that we engage with in the street that are going to be maybe even violent to us or disrespectful to us. But how do we compose ourselves in a manner that we can point them to the gospel with where they're at, meeting them where they're at? in our communication when we're talking and pointing people to Christ. Because, I mean, Paul brought up this his response, and I don't know if he, he thought it was going to turn into this violent response that it did, but it got violent to the point that the Roman guards had to intervene and take him up out of there. So, you know, and that's that may be what happens with us. We may be in situations that may turn violent because of the sake of the gospel. I was going around because we were hosting. We remember we had that seed project we hosted here in Mount Zion. And so I was going around to different homes to invite people, especially within the neighborhood. So I, you know, my aim was to let you know, let people know our neighbors, what was going on since we, I was anticipating. We did. We had a good 300 some more, probably more than that, people here to help pack seeds and um, rice and beans. So in one engagement, as I was talking with a person, I was sharing with them what we were doing and they were tracking with me all the way up until I mentioned the name of the organization we were partnered with. And when I mentioned their, their name, it was like a light bulb switch and they bust me out. They cursed me out and like, I'm, and I was like, I didn't know what happened. I was like, because we were talking about God, we were talking about church. So I'm like, I'm thinking, you know, we're tracking, tracking here. And, and I, you know, and they didn't have anything bad to say about Mount Zion, thankfully, but the organization that we were partnered with left a bad impression in their mouth because of an experience that they had, not even with a friend of a friend, a friend of their child. And it was it was so serious that the husband had to come in and separate us of that the because I don't know I guess I found myself needing to defend, defend defend at least oh you know so you're trying to make up to this I was just trying to get more understanding of like what was going on but this person just got so flustered and like I just wasn't taking the hit that maybe I just need to. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, I was, in, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged. The husband I was like, yeah, you need to go. <laughs> you care by yourself? Yeah. You don't need to go by yourself. You need a companion with you just in case. So they can say, Matt, it's time for us to go. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's 
this situation, I mean, hey, this was our neighbor, so this was a situation where I, I felt like I was in friendly environments, I guess. But yeah, but you, you make a great point, Tracy. Yeah, we sometimes yeah, it's good for us to party and be with others. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely did not anticipate. I did not anticipate that at all. But you, but you, you also—you never know. You never know what's going to be a trigger for somebody. Yeah. You never know what is what a person has gone through that's going to be such hurt that has caused such spiritual hurt for them in terms of, and that's why, I say, like, and and we and even with our engagement, as I like always try to remind you know, for myself, it's not about trying to win the person over in that moment that we're talking. Mm -hmm. about. You may not ever see the conversion. You may never see them give the response to Christ because it's not about you getting the response. It's about you being obedient to the call to share the truth to other people in love. And as long as we're doing it in love, it's not about how they've responded to us. It's about our, our obedience to the call that God has given us, the spiritual gifts that we've equipped us, he's equipped us with to be able to share the love of Christ with others. So you agree with that? <laughs> I was I, I was ready at least to make a defense for Christ. <laughs> I wasn't right. I wasn't running. It was, but I, I responded to the call of the husband. I was like, okay. But and it was. And I'll be honest too. I w I did have trepidations about doing that initially. So I'm not going to sit up here and act like, you know, I was, I was so bold about going doing engagement with people at that capacity. I, was, I, I had some concerns, but, you know, I, I prayed about it. I was like, all right, because it was, it was suggested to me. So I'm like, all right, I, I didn't know this. So, but let's close out with uh, the last scripture. If I can get somebody to read. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Have courage, for as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so it is necessary for you to testify in Rome. I find it interesting that here it was this, power, this argument it broke out about the resurrection, and Christ chose not to appear before the Sanhedrin. He appears only to Paul after these events have occurred as the resurrected Christ. To encourage him to, to go in on with his journey, and this is an example that you know Christ has communicated. Like the, he's equipped us, and we as the believers, we who are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, to do the work. And for Paul, in his case, he now has a mission to go on to Rome in chains, and so that's where we're going to um, see him go from there. So, any final thoughts or questions? It's like I said. It, yeah, Lord, you know, just showed up at the Sanhedrin. You would have squashed all of this. Everybody would have known you're risen. But he doesn't come necessarily to change our circumstance to make it easy for us, right? He assures Paul and strengthens him for the heavy task he has before, before him. And so, likewise, we may encounter hardships that, yeah, the Lord could make it so simple and easy for us, but that's, that's not the purpose, right? Is to, us because we bold we might have to suffer for it but that's why he yeah he just shows up to Paul to assure him you know you want to testify it's necessary for you to do this and it's gonna be tough going <laughs> it'll be tough for him to get getting the wrong it's gonna be hard but God's with them right and, and for us we may face very very much hardships as we in a witness to Christ uh, but yet Christ is assured he's with us I would say, even though everything he went through just now, um, God still tell you, he still got more work to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To prove this. And um, yeah, I just, yeah, I, just, I had another one, but I can't think about it. Yeah. It's good to know that you know, Christ has given us what we need to, to endure for the trials that we may have to face. So, for our extended study, this time I give you the opportunity to read New Testament about both the, uh, the prediction of the destruction of the temple, the resurrection and the coming of man from Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 31. You can pray 
that people believe in Jesus about for the for his, about his resurrection and to prepare for his return. We can apply by listening to people who describe their relationship with Christ, especially when we're cycling or engaging gospel led activity to seek the Holy Spirit and respond in relationship to what they tell you. So that's how we can prepare this. I would encourage we we are called into the mission field in some manner, whether it's as parents, discipling your children, engagement with the people you encounter at work. God is giving you those opportunities. Sometimes they're gonna send them right to your door as opposed to you having to go out. So are you ready? Are you equipped? Or do you feel you gotta hide in the opportunities and when God is directly sending those Jehovah Witnesses your way, those Mormons your way? Those, those are the people groups in a way. So. Next week, we will look at a defense for Paul's life. Getting ready for Rome. So we're going to be in chapter 23, verses 12 through 35. Defense for Paul's life. Sitting a little bit more hectic for Paul. As always, continue uh, to join us if you have opportunity for work, some of the worship at 10. We do this live at 7. If you're watching this online on YouTube after the fact, join us on WebEx. Well, we'd love to see you here presently at um, church. Do I have a volunteer who would like to close us out in prayer? Um, Father God, we thank you for your word today, God. We thank you for the participants here and online, God. Thank you for our facilitator, Mr. Darby, God. Just thank you for what we continue to learn, God. Mm -hmm. The opportunity to grow and um, to learn more about you, to learn that we will face a test. Um, but we are just still to go and, and testify, God, yes. uh, about Jesus. About his resurrection, about him redeeming us back to you, God. So the test will come, but you will be there with us, God. You'll bring us through. So we lift this prayer to you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>